Thank you all for coming. It's nice to have such a big audience. It was a little bit of a surprise to me that we actually could get that many people in the room today, but uh, the more the better. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, future trends. And, um, well, some of the trends are actually already, already starting to, to uh, find its way into the market, but some of them will also be at a little bit uh, longer perspective. So the agenda is um, a little bit where are we now? What is the political climate? I think I will skip that because the previous speaker did that quite brilliantly. So thank you for making my life a lot easier. Um, then I'll just look a in, little into uh, what technologies are being used at the moment. Um, and then I'll look a little bit into how we see the market in different regions around the world and, and where things are happening. And then to the part I think is the most interesting, and that is uh, what direction are we actually going in? So um, we definitely see a focus on warm climate. We see um, a focus on uh, building integrated systems where we have heating, cooling, and air conditioning into one system. And then, of course, uh, small and uh, more low-cost systems. And, um, I don't actually have a lot of uh, material on, on the low-cost solutions, but um, well, here it basically says everything is that we will need to bring down the cost of, of systems. As you also uh, saw in the previous, uh, previous presentation, CO2 is still more expensive than HFC, and um, that is something I don't know if we will get down to a point where we can say it's actually cheaper on the smaller systems, but at least we need to work on it. So this one here I'll basically skip. Maybe there's a little bit uh, new to some of you, is that uh, we actually have a tax in Spain, which is on the same level as in, in Denmark. So I can tell you the tax was enforced here the 1st of January this year. And Spain was more or less in panic, or well, maybe only the refrigeration industry, but they were they are still gasping a little bit. Um, so, what technolo uh, technology are we using at the moment? I would say uh, that goes both for, for UK, but also for uh, uh, most other countries around the world um, that are using transcritical CO2, of course, is that uh, they're using this uh, transcritical booster as we have seen a few times uh, today as well. So that is more or less the current market standard. Um, we have approximately uh, 4,000 systems installed with Danfoss equipment worldwide. We have in Australia, we have in South Africa. South Africa, we have around 30 systems, I believe, which was a big surprise to me, actually. And we see that the market is actually growing quite rapid, rapidly. We are seeing around 100% growth year over year. So it's, uh, it's a nice market to be a part of. So if we should look a little bit to where we are going, then again we see the focus on the warm climate, we see a, a focus on the integrated systems and then the convenience, convenience store solutions. Um, some, of it, uh, some of the things we can, we can do are relatively simple things that are easy to, to do, and some of the other things we, we are looking at they are more uh, difficult and they need more R&D effort from our side. So um, the focus on warm climate, well, the, the challenge for us is to bring transcritical CO2. You saw the lines in the previous presentation as well, so it's nice to be able to have something to, to refer to, but uh, you saw the lines on, on, the, on the chart of Europe, and basically what we are trying to do is we are trying to force that line further south so that we are covering, ideally, worldwide, but certainly all of Europe within five years with this technology here. And maybe not even five years, maybe even one or two years, and we should be ready uh, technology-wise. Um, yeah, well, in Nordic climates, we see around 10% lower energy consumption than um, with HFCs, with this uh, transcritical booster system. But we also need to look at uh, how to, to get into Southern Europe, as I said. So the first um, solution that uh, we are bringing to the market here um, is what we call P2, 
parallel compression. That can, well, there are many names for it. It's, uh, some are also calling it uh, economizer and uh, eco compression and stuff like that. But basically, it's the same thing. Um, in the normal transport equal CO2 system, we have the empty compressors here that are compressing to the gas cooler where we're cooling down. We are having uh, our first expansion here in our high pressure expansion valve. On a warm summer day, we have a mixture of gas and liquid in the pipe here that is roughly 50% gas, 50% liquid. We want to keep our receiver pressure at a certain level, usually 35 to 40 bar, somewhere in that region, that equivalents to 0 to 5 bar, uh, degree C. So that means if we are not removing the gas here from the vessel, then the pressure will go up. So um, in a traditional system, we will use a, a gas bypass valve, but it's not really a brilliant idea because the thing is you have the gas here, let's say 37 bar, and then you're throttling the gas down to 26 bar and then to compress it again. You will not uh, win any prize in, in physics for doing that. The smart solution is, of course, to take the gas at the high pressure you have here in the receiver, put it into the compressor, and then compress it again. That will save you some uh, compressor work doing that. It will also save you some installed capacity on your compressors because the, the density of the gas is a lot higher. Um, so this is a solution we see coming in now. And if we are going into warm climate, we see energy saving around about 5 to 10 percent on, on, on the hot days. In the cold days, we will not be able to operate our parallel compressor here because the, the gas volume for the compressor is not large enough. So then we will simply switch back and then run with the valve. So this is something we are already doing now. and. I don't know the exact number, but probably somewhere between 10 and 20 systems we have out running here in, in Europe and, and the US with this principle here at the moment. So I'd, I would not say it's a well-proven concept, but it's not a new idea, and it's something that is very quite easy to implement. And we also have controls algorithm for switching uh, between valve and, and compressor. We also have that in place. Um, another solution which we also saw in previous slides, is uh, this subcooling chiller here, where we are basically uh, subcooling um, the gas out of the gas cooler. That means that when we expand down here, our gas fraction is actually uh, a lot smaller. So that is, of course, saving us some compressor work here. So basically, we are, we are moving some, some work from the compressors here to the compressors here, which is a good idea. Um, the reason why I do not see this as the magical tool in our toolbox is that I cannot see what the next step is. Where with parallel compression, I will show you what I think the next step is in, in just a second. So uh, this is something that is also easy to implement, and especially if you have an air conditioning system where you have a, a water chiller or something like that, if you have that on site already, then this system here is very cheap and easy to, uh, to install. Um, so we also have that out running in, I don't know the, the number, but we also have that out running in, in several applications. And um, the switching algorithm for, for this one here will actually be the same as for, for the valve parallel compressor solution. So, the two solutions I just showed you before, that is something you can just go ahead and, and do, do today. Uh, they are using off-the-shelf components, and it's basically just go ahead and do it. Then there are some things that needs a little bit more attention from our side, but uh, I'll just show you a little bit what we're working on. And um, the key here is ejectors. Ejectors is a way of recovering expansion work. Um, roughly around 20% of the energy we put into our compressors here, we can recover as work on the, um, in, in the throttling here. So we can basically take out 20% of the compressor work, ideally. 
but well, it's not an ideal world we are living in, so out of the 20%, we can recover around one third of that. So that means that we can probably recover somewhere between five and 10% using adjacent systems. So now you know what, the, what benefit we are looking into. The good thing about ejector systems is that the saving you get on the ejector here, the 5%, uh, 5 to 10%, you can actually add them on top of the 5 to 10% you got from the parallel compression system, which is also a part of this system here. So in, in general, the saving introducing ejectors together with parallel compression will give you a saving in the area 10 to 20% on a warm summer day. And we're actually hoping that, or we are believing that that is actually enough to actually move CO2 quite a bit further south than where we are today. And maybe I should have begun explaining how the ejection system actually works, but uh, well, better late than never. You still have your MT compressors here, which is compressing to the gas cooler. Then we have a valve and an ejector in parallel here. The, the valve will be probably closed and uh, we might not need that. Then the, the high pressure uh, fluid is entering the ejector. And the first thing we have in the ejector is we have a nozzle. And the nozzle is creating a very high speed. We are around Mark 1 out of the nozzle. When you have a very high velocity, then you also have a low pressure. This low pressure we are using to take gas from the MT suction line, putting that into the ejector, and then mixing that with our high pressure fluid. Then uh, after this mixing, we are expanding again the, the flow. So the result is that if we have, let's say, 90 bar up here, then uh, here in the mixing chamber, we will have the same pressure as we have here on, on the um, on the empty side, which is usually around 26 bar, which is minus 10. Then the ejector will actually lift the gas around, let's say, 5 to 10 bar from the empty suction here to the receiver. So that means that the gas will then go into the receiver, and then it will go into the parallel compressor here. So you can actually say that we are using the ejector as a first stage compression for our uh, parallel compressor here. That is the general idea of, of the ejector, the gas ejector. There are different ways of utilizing this uh, expansion work, and, and ejectors is one of them. Uh, there are also expansion machines and, and other kind of stuff, but the ejector has one big advantage, and that is that it's relatively simple. There are no moving parts and so on, so it should be relatively simple to produce. Some of the other machines on paper, they should have a higher efficiency because 30, 35 percent is not what I would call a very high efficiency. But usually the other machines, they only take the, the recovery of the expansion work. They take that as one efficiency and then you need the compressor where you can add another efficiency. So the combined efficiency of the system is actually not that high. So that's actually why ejectors are relatively uh, attractive for us. So this is one way of uh, utilizing ejectors as we see. Another ejector system we also see in the market, and we have that out running already as well. We have a few installations using this uh, ejector system here. We already have that in, in operation. Um, but another type of ejector system we see here um, is what we call a, a liquid injector system. And uh, basically, again, we, we use the high pressure fluid, expand that with the ejector, and then we are taking liquid from the receiver here. And then you might be asking, why do we have liquid here? Well, that is, of course, because we actually run our empty evaporators. We run them as flooded evaporators, like in a pump circulated system, like an industrial system. So that means that we are utilizing the entire surface of the evaporator, using the ejector to pump the liquid back again so basically, our ejector will be some kind of pump instead of uh, the pump we are only seeing in these type of systems. 
Um, the systems we have out running in, in Switzerland at the moment, we can see that we are running in, in low load conditions, we are running minus one on uh, MT cases. So this is not necessarily the recovery of expansion work we are so interested in. This is mainly more the flooded evaporators we are interested in, a simple way of doing that. And uh, well, let's say that we can maybe, uh, in, in low load conditions, we can maybe lift our evaporation temperature three, four Kelvin, something like that which is also a significant saving and will also help us in, in warmer climate, but this can also be used in cold climates, no, no problem there. So then the integrated systems. What we see is that um, we see that we have heat recovery and sometimes the heat recovery <coughs> We cannot get more energy out of our system than we put in. That's one of the rules of nature. So um, if we are not utilizing the, the or if we cannot um, get enough heat from the heat recovery, then we use uh, additional heat pumps. I think we use the heat pumps a little bit different than what we saw in previous presentations, but I'll show you. Then air conditioning is something we see combined with uh, cooling on medium temperature and low temperature. So we get everything in one pack. So we are not talking uh, so much uh, refrigeration pack anymore. We are actually talking more about uh, energy pack. And that makes very good sense in many ways because when we have bought the pack in the first place, then we can just as well utilize it as, for as many things as we can. So heat recovery, I will not spend too much time on heat recovery because this is, again, very similar to what we saw in the previous presentation. But we offer you the, the possibility to do heat recovery on the first stage here, which we normally we call it tap water, but you can use it for air curtains and whatever you want, basically. But a high temperature heat recovery, then we have one for space heating, and then, of course, we have our gas cooler here. Um, if we look at the benefits, then um, the trend we see is also that the, the boiler in the store or district heating installation and so on is more or less taking out of the store. So uh, we are saving the installation cost on, on, a, on a boiler and, and everything there. And then we are substituting that with our transcritical refrigeration system. So if you look at the TV on that, then you can see if we are using a 404A system here, then this is the CO2 from the electric, uh, electricity uh, usage. This part here is from the gas usage, and this part here is from the refrigerant. And of course, uh, if we change to a CO2 booster, then the refrigerant part disappears, the energy consumption is a little bit lower, so that basically covers it. But we still have the problem that we, uh, uh, we, we need the heat here. If we change to a transcritical CO2 booster with heat recovery, then of course our energy consumption is a little bit higher because we need to run the, the pressures a little bit higher in our system and that of course is costing a little bit. But at the end, we are having a saving on, uh, on our CO2 account because we save the entire gas part. So that is basically removed. And I know you think, well, TV, CO2 emissions, what about British pounds? So I don't know, well, I promise too much, this is in euros, but nevertheless. Um, I don't know exactly if the energy prices, they, they fit for the UK, but it should be a relatively good match to at least uh, the rest of Europe, so it's probably not way off. So if you see again, this is the, the cost we have for energy, this is the cost we have for gas, on a 404A system. If you go to a booster system, well, the gas part is the same, but the electricity part is a little bit smaller. If we then go into a CO2 booster with heat recovery, we can see that, well, basically we get a saving on our cost, total cost of 28% or 21% if you like, on, if we compare CO2, CO2, because the gas part is basically being removed of course, then the electricity consumption is a little bit higher, but that more than covers the, the part for, um, for the gas part. <coughs> um, 
then the problem is just what if we cannot get enough heat out of our refrigeration system? If we don't have any refrigeration load, then we do not have any heat. And we cannot take out more energy than we are putting in. So if we need to take out more energy, then we need to put more energy in. And that can be a, a big variety of uh, heat sources. It can be ground source heat, it can be air, it can basically be any heat source you have available. The one we always have available is there, but um, if you have anything better, then of course that's a possibility. So um, one way of doing it is to actually put on extra evaporators. Um, and here the evaporator is on, on low temperature. That is something we are, we have to do it like this if we, for instance, go to Norway and Sweden and those places because it is so cold that our uh, MTE compressors, they cannot run at, at these uh, temperatures. So we need to put it on low temperature. The efficiency doing this is not fantastically high. Uh, I would be lying if I said that this is a, is a very um, a good way of, of doing things regarding COP. But the thing is that you need to also keep into, uh, in, in, into mind what the alternative is. And in many, way, in many situations, it can be electricity with a COP of one, and I think we can, we can still beat that. Um, and then you also need to keep into, in mind what is the investment costs and how many running hours per year do you have doing this. If we go to a little bit warmer climate, then we can, of course, put the evaporator on our MT, uh, MT, uh, medium temperature circuit. And I guess in many places here in, in the UK, if you need to do something like this with external uh, heat sources, then uh, MT would probably be okay for you to, uh, to use that. And then uh, the last thing is, of course, air conditioning. And I'm not proposing that CO2 will be a miracle in, in air conditioning because basically CO2 might not be the right refrigerant for air conditioning. But if you have invested in a CO2 pack and your air conditioning is only for two weeks a year, then the alternative could be to actually install a, a chiller, but the, the cost of a chiller will be very high. So maybe taking the, the air conditioning load from, from the CO2 system might actually not be a bad idea. So it's a possibility and it's somewhere where you have to, to evaluate what is the cost and what is the benefit and so on. Um, the smart thing about CO2 is that our receiver pressure is around zero degrees C, a little bit higher than zero degrees C normally. So that means that you can actually just put, now I've put it inside the, the receiver here, but you actually have a pressure here, a suction pressure or evaporation temperature at a level where you can actually make your water for, for air conditioning if you like. So it's a relatively simple investment. So coming down to the con conclusion, I think we can say that uh, CO2 is coming to a mature stage. Um, we have been doing this since, well, it took off big time in, in Denmark since uh, 2007 with uh, transcritical CO2. And um, I think the, the technology has been around for so long that everybody actually recognizes now that it's not, uh, it's not a big risk anymore. We see very, very high growth rates. Um, it also seems that we have, um, with a transcritical booster, with a gas bypass, we have more or less standardized, more or less everybody on the same solution, and now we are actually developing from that as a, as a core, and uh, I think that's actually very good instead of seeing 20 different systems in the market and we could spend all the time fighting on which solution was the best one. Um, yeah, now we, uh, the first years we were very focused on having re robust and reliable systems. Now we, um, the focus is changing a little bit because now we have actually achieved the robust and, uh, robustness and reliability. Um, so now we, we are focusing more on, on efficiency and uh, bringing value to the end user. So, well, we also need to do a little bit of advertising. So, 
basically we have a pretty wide range of uh, CO2 components, more than I can actually show on, on, uh, on one slide. Uh, and we are continuously improving our portfolio by putting in more and more components. And it's quite clear that our strategy on, on valves is that we go for 90 bar, we consider that low pressure, and 140 bar we consider being high pressure. So that's the, the pressures we are, we are moving forward with. And I know that we maybe not need 90 or 140, but that is the solution we, we are moving forward with because it's very expensive for us to, to, to change to higher pressures later if we, if we want to. Um, yeah. So basically, this has been one long talk about transcritical systems. But uh, whatever solution you, you choose, if it's a cascade or a transcritical solution, we more or less have the components you need and we also have the expertise to, to back you up at all times. So um, I think I'll say that's the end of it. Anybody might have a question to ask? Thank you.